Ladies, I am Shusara Kona Kumara. Welcome to Satsang. You are beginningless. You are endless. You are divine. Good evening. I'm Shasada, joined again by Piela Yen. Thank you for joining us again for Satsang. Um, we're going to start with the protection. So if I could have you all take a nice deep breath, get yourself centered. Mother, Father, God that I am, through the great central sun hierarchy, through the office of the Christ, through the order of Melchizedek, I call upon Archangel Michael to bring the sapphire blue ray. Cut away, cut away, cut away anything in all of our four lower vehicles not emanating directly from our I am presence. I now call on Archangel Zekiel, Keeper of the Violet Flame. Blaze, blaze, blaze the violet flame through all of our four lower bodies. Transmute, transmute, transmute all the psychic debris Michael has cut free. I now bring forth the invincible ring pass knot and the mirror blue light of invisibility to completely surround each of us. And I call forth a shaft of pure Christ light for each one of us listening tonight. I ask that they be brought to the center of the earth where I call on Archangel Gabriel to completely seal these tubes of light. And I ask that the legions of Michael completely surround each tube. And now I ask that our vibrations be raised high above the psychic and astral worlds to the highest realm of illumined truth we each can attain at this time. And now, Mother, Father, God, we place ourselves in service to you and to humanity. PLEN and I place ourselves in service to those listening to the program. We ask that only that which is direct from you be permitted into our perceptions and that all else of the lower mind be kept out. And we ask that only that which is direct from you be permitted through us. And because we have asked this, we consider it so. So be it. I'm going to ask you to stay in this meditative place with me for a minute. The energies um, are still running very high. And I feel it would be a good opportunity for all of us collectively to uh, hold a little space and let's allow tonight for some whatever kind of transmutation of discordant energies that can take place through our physical vehicles um, let's all call that forward place yourself in self in service in your own way and just ask that uh, spirit move through you in whatever way is necessary tonight for the highest good of all concerned. And let's let that just kind of run for a minute. There is an awful lot running, so if you're experiencing any kind of physical sensation, just try not to attach to it. Just let it run. It'll clear itself out.
there. Did you feel it? Pialyan, did you feel that? Yes, I did. Yeah, it, it's funny. It, uh, it reaches a certain point and then it just kind of abates. It just kind of pecks off. <laughs> um, thank you all for doing that with me. Uh, if you were experiencing, uh, the energy was really potent. So if you were experiencing feeling a little nauseous even, um, I, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> Someone's smiling at me over here. Um, yeah, so just know whenever you do that kind of work, I mean, you literally are allowing for this physical vehicle to run these energies that are discordant. They're very polarized. So we're letting them actually move through us and um, through our ability to uh, hold a certain light quotient we can take on more and more of these energies and then we can actually move them through ourselves and let them run so that they can uh, transmute out back into their divine state. Uh, so thank you all for taking part in that with me. You can do that on your own anytime. Uh, just tonight, I really felt uh, there was a need. So wonderful. Uh, do we have anything in particular? Oh, I know one thing you wanted to start with since it's on top of my head was the Pope Francis speech from last week. Yes. Okay. So we had, uh, it was, it was lovely. We had one of our listeners um, who is, uh, is a follower of the Catholic faith who got very confused because, uh, and of course I'm not Catholic, so forgive me for not understanding the terminology, but what did they call it? The third Vatican council? Vatican three. Okay. So um, the listener had contacted PLN saying, um, to my knowledge, there has been no Vatican III. <laughs> I think we're still on two, whatever that means. Uh, so that led to a whole um, searching on her end, and she discovered that this was uh, something that uh, was on Snopes as being uh, not uh, accurate. So I did my own little research, and it was actually a satirical um, article that was written and whoever got a hold of the article and was putting it out there on the internet um, neglected to include the little box at the bottom that basically stated that, you know, this was just the author's kind of um, personal opinion. So it's kind of funny, you know, and I think that the beauty of it is that it was, it was really beautifully placed last week in what we had to talk about. And you know, Pope Francis is certainly a more progressive pope and, and doing, you know, wonderful works. Um, but my feeling about the whole, like, I don't really care that it wasn't real because, you know, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater is kind of how I look at it. You know, what the article was bringing forward is something that many of us have always felt to be true anyway. And we carry that within us. And, um, it's it's a, it's a beautiful thing. I I love it when stuff like this happens. Um, I'm reminded of when Obama was at that rally at the very end of um, the first presidential run. You know when he won and he had all of those people and it was just crazy. The energy was just crazy. And anyone who remembers back then um, seeing pictures of all the orbs. Remember the the orb pictures that came out of that when he won the presidency. I mean it was. They took pictures of, I mean, just millions of orbs in that crowd of people. It was phenomenal. And the thing that I love about it is that, you know, it didn't really, the, the story of Obama and, and whether he was capable of making any change, whether he's just a puppet who, you know, really doesn't have any power at all, whether whatever, it doesn't matter. The fact is that, that the uh, message that he was bringing stirred something in the people, and that is the piece that is so important, you know, and, and so the same thing with this Pope Francis article. He didn't, he didn't actually say, it. oh, well, that's okay. What did it stir in all of us? And, and it's the same thing. It makes an impact, you know. Um, and the beautiful thing is, like, people always remember, like, the first thing they hear. Here we go back to our conversation in the last couple of weeks concerning third-party communication, right? Because I love this, like, politically um, – People will use this because they'll come out like a politician will come out and, you know, come forward with a, like a bold faced lie about, say, their opponent. And of course, the opponent can come back and prove that it's not true, but the damage has been done. Right. And everyone will always remember that. And my husband um, made a comment the other day. I think he made it to you, PLN, about um, how many people out there when they're polled still believe that um, – it, uh, I'm sorry, I just lost. His, I lost the, the name of the country. 
the country that initially was blamed for 9-11. I just completely lost it. Oh, it was uh, Saudi Arabia, right? No. No. <laughs> you can tell we're thinking? very political people. Iraq. 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 Thank That's you. That's what, oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but a couple of spiritual flakes over here who <laughs> don't know Iraq from Saudi Arabia. Anyway, point being that it was proven, you know, over and over and over again. And the powers that be came forward and said, look, you know, we kind of were lying about the whole weapons of mass destruction thing. But people actually still believe it. So it's like once it gets planted, remember I told you this, you know, the last couple of weeks, you're very responsible for those words that come out of your mouth. So you have to be very careful on how you speak about people because you once you say something about a person to, to someone else, that seed is planted. And at that point, um, you, you, they won't be conscious of it, but they're looking for proof of what you've said. So hold, hold that. Uh, and, and the reverse is true, too, which is why I was excited about the Pope Francis thing and still am. Because that got out there, you know, I and my excitement, my naive excitement, you know, blasted it out on the airwaves and people heard it. And in that moment, it made an impact, you know, and that still hangs out there. That didn't, it doesn't disappear just because it comes forward that he didn't actually say it. It's still there. So that's a beautiful thing. Um, but I did want to correct myself since I was, uh, I was incorrect in, in that whole thing. And I wanted to make sure people understood that. Okay, so that being said, is there anything specific that we want to start out with tonight? Uh, one thing on the list was staying in your innocence. Yes, this is really important at this time. Um, 2013 was a real doozy <laughs> for, for most of us. It's like everyone had a I think it's like 2012 was very challenging, but people were holding a certain mindset all through 2012 because coming up on the end of it, they had expectations about what they thought it was going to be and just all of this stuff was sitting there. 2013 was kind of this no man's land for everybody walking into it. No one really knew what to expect. So some people, I have, I have one student in particular who was like devastated coming off of 2012 when she kind of didn't feel the change, right? Or didn't see it in the world. It was probably more that because she had, you know, there was so much information being thrown around on the internet about what to expect. And I mean, there's just some crazy stuff out there, right? And so you hear all this and it makes it hard to discern what's potentially true, what's definitely not true and all of that. So she recognized after once we started 2013 that she was like really depressed, and initially couldn't figure out why. And then she tracked it back to the fact that, you know, she didn't feel like anything actually happened at the, uh, on December 21st. And actually a ton happened, right? But she had to be pretty sensitive uh, to the energies to, to really feel it. So for most people in the world, they wouldn't have experienced it as, as anything, right? Just another day. Um, so, you know, moving into 2013, she kind of came in in this very different space. Now, other people had the exact opposite. So they came into 2013 with, you know, like ready and raring to go, like, woohoo, here we are, you know, and we're, you know, moving forward in the new energies and everything. And that is exactly what we were doing. And 2013, you know, was, was really challenging because we were moving forward in a whole new energetic that the planet just hasn't seen. And so everybody got slammed a little bit. From that, you know, even if you have been doing extremely deep spiritual work, I mean, you're getting thrown things just left and right. You know, all this stuff is coming up, and and you do, you know, it's remember, it's very, it's very paradoxical because you're living in in the world of opposites. So remember, like the more peace you find within, the more you see chaos outside. <laughs> it just seems to happen that way, right? You just kind of have to expect it. So for the light workers who had been, you know, holding this space and who who certainly carry that space of of peace and equanimity and all that with them on a daily basis, um, a lot of us ended up feeling kind of like rudderless for the year. You know, really like you're just kind of being thrown about. <laughs> on stormy seas, you know, and now moving into 2014, what I'm feeling is that we're going to get an amplification of that, 
you know, and so people hear that and they're like, oh, great. <laughs> That's just great. <laughs> and so I wanted to mention, you know, this is the time to stay in your innocence. And, and what does that mean, right? So to stay in your innocence is, is to just, you know, well, it, it's to be the Christ, but it's to be in your heart and to, it, especially at this time, really kind of devote yourself to staying in that um, space of what I like to call just loving equanimity, okay? Hold that space of not picking sides, not don't go out there to try to prove someone wrong all the time and someone brings something to you and you know it's not accurate, you know, watch yourself that you aren't constantly pointing out to someone where they're at fault or how they're not right. You know, just like all of that. Because that, that doesn't do anything to, to um, you know, raise the consciousness of the planet, certainly. And to stay in your innocence is to view the world through the eyes of a small child. You know, that space of wonderment, that space where it can witness the things that are going on, but it doesn't have a story behind them, right? Because it hasn't built up enough um, past experience and memory to have a story. So it just kind of witnesses. And... I think that this is just an important message right now because starting this year out, you know, the influx of light has been really, really strong. And we are getting, you know, bombarded with a light quotient that we haven't felt before. And it, it will bring up anything that's hidden in those little dark recesses that you found in your own psyche and kind of pushed things into those spaces, it's going to bring it all up. So you don't need to be in a space of, of judgment toward yourself either. You know, let it all come and be willing to look at it and be willing to observe it, um, not from a judgmental place, but from seeing where maybe, um, you know, you could have done better, right? And be willing to um, I, I love the the Maya Angelou quote, you did what you did um, because it was all you knew. But when you knew better, you did better. Like that, that to me is, is so perfect because that's where everybody needs to be sitting. Be willing to be honest with yourself and see where you haven't been loving. Right. And then be willing to fix it however it needs to be fixed. Sometimes that means literally you recognize you need to go and apologize to a person to let them know that, that you're sorry and not from the space of, um, I'm sorry I did this, but, right? Yeah. That's, that's, I love that. Sorry I did that to you, but if you, if you hadn't have done this, I would I'm like, well, so I'm sorry. Was there an apology in there someplace? I, <laughs> I think I lost it. <laughs> Be humble in your apologies. Apologize because, you feel it in your heart, not because you have to show them why they did something wrong, because that's not an apology. I mean, please, if there's one thing you can walk away with tonight, it's that right there. When you apologize and you stick the word but in there, you just lost the apology. It's not an apology anymore. All right. It may have started with good intentions, but you kind of killed it. So let's go back to the humble one who can just say, I'm sorry. You know, I could have done better and I didn't and I'm sorry. The rest of the story doesn't matter. And let's function from that place this year. And we'll see major change. I mean, imagine if we all just functioned from that place. We'd see change very quickly, right? So remember that um, to stay in that space really takes uh, an incredible amount of vigilance on your part. Because... Your natural reaction, of course, is going to be to fall into whatever stories have been uh, programmed in your matrix. So that will also automatically become like your natural reaction. So now is the time to stay in your heart and be vigilant, constantly looking for those things that are wanting to compress themselves around your heart. So for um, those of you who who haven't uh, spent much time with me, you'll know that, that the thought forms that you um, identify with and the beliefs that you identify with, that there is an energetic to them. I mean, they're energy, right? And they have this way 
about them. Now think it's okay. So it's like the exact opposite of what your heart would do. So what did your heart do? Your heart is constantly expanding, right? The energetic of the heart is to, to expand infinitely in all directions. And that's all it knows to do. Well, think of it this way. Anything that you've attached an identification to a belief, a thought form does the exact opposite. It literally will um, compress itself around the heart and push in on the heart. And the energetic of that is that then you aren't able to um, experience yourself as your heart uh, nearly as effectively, if at all, um, as you could without that compression of, of those beliefs that are sitting around the heart space. Um, and this is something that you can start to witness in your own body. You, you, you will get to a point where, you'll, where you will see how subtle the energies are. Um, and when you're really in your heart, you can witness just one thought um, that is discordant. When it comes, you'll feel the energy compress. And it literally does. It's like it just pushes in on the heart. Um, so that's something you could start to really look at. You know, our cues, it's kind of like the body can't lie to you. You know, it just can't. It's not built to do that. It's built to to be a reflection of the state of consciousness um, that that is utilizing it. And the body will always tell you what's going on. So when you, when you get in really deep to your work, um, you know, the mind becomes, when the observer is very strong, it becomes very good at, at grabbing thoughts, you know. And sometimes it doesn't even come as the thought. It comes as the sensation in the body first. So it, the thought has to be there, but you won't witness it as an actual, like a word in your head, right? Um, or a collection of words, but you'll experience the energy. So for people who get really good with their, with their work, they literally will sense the energetic first, and then they can stop it right there before it even turns into um, conscious thought that has uh, words to it. So, okay, so I just ran off. I, I just ran crazy there. So, yeah, so stay in your innocence. Right. Yeah. Lesson number one today: stay in your innocence. <laughs> um, and then one, the other thing that you wanted to get into was uh, actually, do you want to do meditation first? Because that's probably a shorter one. To talk about meditation. Oh yes, you know I would like to. Uh, this comes up a lot, and I just, I just um, saw this come from a, a student, and. I really want to talk about this because everyone has such a, um, there are so many thoughts out there about what meditation is supposed to be and how you're supposed to know when you're doing it right or when you're having a good meditation versus a bad meditation, right? And, you know, it's all just monkey mind, <laughs> first of all, all of it is. So just, so just drop it. You know, meditation doesn't have to be um, with your eyes closed. You can do open eye meditation in front of a candle flame or in front of a mandala or a picture. I mean, you could you could do open eye in front of uh, just outdoors. I've done open eyes with the moon, a full moon, which is an amazing experience. Um, if you're not comfortable doing open eye meditations, you do closed eye meditations, and that's fine too. And there's nothing wrong if you fall asleep, so don't beat yourself up if you go into meditation and you wake up 20 minutes later. Um, I was just explaining to PLAN earlier that uh, when the body is really exhausted, you literally in meditation will move to a, a certain state of consciousness where you'll lose your um, conscious awareness here, and it goes into what it all, it almost feels like a sleep state, um, and I'm sure many of you have experienced this. You'll be in meditation, all of a sudden you'll kind of pop awake, and you'll feel like you were sleeping, but it doesn't feel like sleeping. It's not the same, and it's not. So this is a this is a very unique state where it the energy literally is recharging um, your physical form, and you need to have a re a well rested body, you know, to go in and do very deep. Uh, meditations where where you're capable of holding that vibration um, for an extended period and staying conscious for all of it. So, uh, so again, you know, if you fall asleep, if you feel like you fell asleep, don't beat yourself up over it. Obviously, the body needed it, or it wouldn't have happened. And sometimes you just move into a, a level of vibration uh, that you are. Um, I don't know how to, how to really word it. Uh, like your conscious mind just can't handle it. 
probably the best way for me to say it. And so you'll tune out, right? And then you'll, you lose your conscious awareness. Um, but just know that even in those states, uh, there's a greater part of you anyway that's doing exactly what it needs to be doing. And you're having the experience whether you seem to be there for it or not, <laughs> right? You always are. Um, but in meditation, you know, so many people go in and they're like, well, nothing's happening. And then they hear from, you know, if you have someone like, like PLAN here, she, when she goes into meditation, you know, her, um, she's quite capable, uh, with her, with her inner vision of, of seeing different things that are going on. And she's capable of tapping in and, and, um, seeing the masters and getting messages from them. And, and then you'll have other people you'll hear about, you know, they, Oh, I used to have people who used to come to me all the time about their, you know, kind of astral adventures when they're in meditation, you know, they're off on other planets and they're doing all other stuff, you know, which is lovely. There's nothing wrong with it, but there's nothing wrong with you if you're not having that either. Keep in mind that if you're, you know, off doing astral travel during meditation, that's lovely, but that's still ha all existing within the the fallen consciousness. Okay. So you're not like, you're not like escaping, you know, third dimensional reality just because you're off in the astral plane. You understand? The astral plane still exists within this um, paradigm that we're, we're seem to be existing in. So if you're one of those people out there who doesn't have those experiences, you know, you're, you're not worse off for it at all. And actually it can be the opposite because a lot of people get very stuck in how alluring it is to go and, you know, to go these different places and meet these different, you know, beings and have all these experiences and they can get very stuck in that, you know. Um, all roads ultimately lead to the same destination, but that kind of thing, when you get into a more, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? It escapes me. Uh, like indigenous people's like a, shaman, a shamanic kind of tradition. Yeah. You get into that kind of a thing. And of course it ultimately will lead to the same place, but it's like, you know, if, if the work that we're doing is like the, the straight path up the mountain, you know, they're taking that long curvy spiral that's working its way up. Like that's the difference. Right. So I always tell people, you know, it's not just, I, I don't judge it either way. It's not good or bad. It just is. But you know, all of these realms that you move through in meditation and things you might see and experience, it's all still part of this um, programming that has gone on here. And you're just kind of there to witness, not to attach to any of it, just witness it. Um, so if you don't have it, you know, don't, don't stress yourself out. I mean, I will tell you that I used to see a lot in meditation. And for the last, uh, oh gosh, a couple years, easy for me, when I go in, it's just void. I mean, there's nothing. It's just void. I don't know how else to say it. Um, and it's beautiful. It's like there's this unbelievable love and peace that just sits there. And there's nothing else that has to happen at all. Um, and of course, I don't have an expectation that anything more needs to be there. And it's just beautiful. And, you know, I don't want to come out. But it's like, well, so what are you doing? Well, uh, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just gorgeous. So if if you are one of those, don't beat yourself up over this. You know, go in. I would tell you, you know, continue to challenge yourself to be in meditation for longer periods. Because a lot of people get stuck in a, um, like their, it seems like after, say, 15, 20 minutes, their body just kind of wants to come out. And you do need to continually kind of train yourself to stay in for longer periods. Because, you know, it takes a lot of um, kind of, effort to to go into deeper and deeper levels of meditation where consciousness is really pulling itself um, away from the physical form and you're and you're there witnessing all of it uh, it does take effort and it takes stamina you know like a spiritual stamina or, or a buildup of spiritual power and if you only ever meditate for like 15 minute blocks you just don't you're not putting in enough time to build that up so i i would always tell people that's something that you're doing in meditation is literally you are, it's like you've got, um, well, in what I was taught was that in the, the Dantian, which is like the under your belly button, kind of in that, um, that area, you have uh, a place there where you can store, um, reserves of, of what I would call spiritual power. Uh, and when you're in meditation, that's getting replenished and built up. 
And then there are times where you actually have to draw on those reserves. And those times aren't in meditation. Those times, um, well, I guess they could be if you really were pushing to, you know, stay in a long time or something. But like those reserves get used when you're just living your daily life. And let's say we're in an experience that's going on and you witness something and, and everything in your being seems to want to polarize and to grab onto one side. You literally can use those reserves to help you maintain that space of equanimity. Um, and it's other than me telling you, you know, it when you experience it, that's really all I can tell you, because that's exactly what it is. Um, but that but you, you are doing that when you're in meditation, which is a really beautiful thing. So if you are one of those people who likes to meditate for really short periods, just start to push yourself a little more, you know, see if with you kind of pop out, you know, just go back in, see if you can make it for another 15 or 20 minutes, you know, before too long, you'll be in meditation for an hour and a half and, and you won't even recognize that any time has gone by, you know, it's, it's quite beautiful. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that does that answer it you think for most people? Yeah, I think so. Um, okay, so next subject was um, how people think that enlightenment is like the end all and that we're still here. You're here until you're not. <laughs> you you definitely are here until you're not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. So here's the thing. This is a, a um, I love to pick on new age people, <laughs> don't I? <laughs> I probably just ticked off a whole bunch of people listening. I love to do it because it's it's such a trap. There is on one on one end of of what the um, new age stands for. It is actually a, a amazingly beautiful, you know, coming from, and it has great truth coming from a non-polarized place. However, 99.9% um, .9 of the people who are involved in the new age are functioning in their space of love and light from a polarized place. And so what it ends up doing is it ends up being a trap for them that they get caught in um, where really there's no difference between someone who's stuck in the space of all love and light and someone who's living the other side of it where everything is dark and negative right because it's two sides of the same coin it's they're both um you know opposite of the other but none is better than the other and that's the difference is the person who's you know living in the space of everything is love and light and i deny the dark you know feels that their side is correct and the guy who's or woman who's standing in everything is dark and crappy <laughs> they're doing the same thing they feel that their side is correct you know and what they can't see is that neither one is really true. And, and it's their only their belief in what they're holding that is keeping them trapped in that space. Um, and this is, this is tough because, you know, you can't have this conversation without uh, religion coming in, you know, because religion and Christianity, especially in, in our country here, is such a anchor point for the collective here in, in America and in, in the Western world, I'd say in general, um, that anytime you bring something up, it triggers something in you. Even if you weren't raised in a Christian family, like you could have been raised in like maybe your parents, you know, were baptized and stuff, but like you, as a child, like you didn't go to church, you didn't do any of that. So you really didn't have any dogma or anything like that. You'd still have this stuff sitting there because collectively we're all holding it. So it's kind of impossible to not feel it. And so when, when we look at a religion, you know, what is, what did, you, what did Jesus teach? You know, turn the other cheek, right? And like, it's like all the, the things that we would associate with the Christ seems to be very much just love and light, love and light, love and light. So it can be very, it's very confusing for people. And then it'll really be a turnoff to someone if you say to them, you know, you're, you're repressing another whole side that's going on because you're holding yourself in a space of denial over the reality of what's actually happening here. And, and they can't, they, they can't allow themselves to see that. Um, but the thing is that, you know, <laughs> when you see past um, the world of duality, 
that's all there is, is love and light. I mean, that's all there is. And you can be in that space, but you can still function in that space. Like if you look at, if you look at Jesus, you know, Jesus exhibited what I would call righteous anger, right? Remember Jesus with the money changers, right? That whole thing. And it was because it was right action, right? What the money changers was doing was not right. It was not in the benefit of all. It was not right. And so you saw him angry, right? Now, people who, who stand on the space of, you know, everything has to be love and light would deny the part of themselves that would be angry because they would see it as unloving, you say. And we have to be very careful with what we attach to as far as what does love mean? Because sometimes love is angry and sometimes love is right in your face, you know, and it can seem to be belittling even. And so we have to be really careful with that because the people who have really been, um, you know, snookered in that, that new age space are, are just running away from this whole huge part of their own psyche that needs attention, right? It needs to be brought to the surface. And we can't live in the space of denial anymore. And so for anyone who is denying any part of themselves that, um, you know, it has, has a voice in there, whether it be conscious or unconscious, it does have a voice. And if you're denying that part or repressing that part, it's going to come out. And, and you know, we're really going to see it more and more and more. No question. So better to, you know, I always tell the people that I work with, it's like you have an opportunity in doing this work to go in and discover these things that have been kind of sitting there latent. Um, you can go in and discover them and you can work them to dissolve them so that you don't have to live it out in physicality. You see? So if you go in and you do the work around, um, say, that you, say you have a whole... Um, really bitter side of you that you've been denying. You refuse to, to see it. Um, oh, I'll use this one for an example because I, I have a student that um, she knows who she is. I call her Sunshine. And she would tell you like she was in complete denial and, and repressed this inner bitch that she had. <laughs> and it's the only word for it because that's exactly what it was. And she always felt like she had to have this sunny face for everybody and of course, the world perceived her as being so together and so happy. You know, she looked like she's a beautiful girl and has an exciting job and she's got a great body and, you know, she's a great personality, very fun to be with. And she's always busy and doing stuff, but she was miserable. You know, she was just absolutely miserable. And so when we really started, I, I you know, was able to get her kind of slowly to really start seeing what was going on under the surface she saw there was this whole kind of bitchy self to her that she'd been pushing down pushing down pushing down and when she finally let it out it was like this amazing experience for her because it was like oh my gosh <laughs> you know it's okay right and and that's all it needed it just needed a voice right and then when she was okay with it and not judging it for being a bad thing, it didn't need to be there anymore. You see what I'm saying? As long as we judge it as bad, we're not going to allow ourselves to do it. And then we're going to see everyone around us as a bitch. Because we don't want to see it in ourselves, right? But once we can, you know, see it for what it is and be like, okay, so I am. There I am, right? Bitchy me. And let it be there and, and not be in judgment about it. Let it do its thing. It really just doesn't need to be there anymore. So that's what we're, we take that understanding and move it to, you know, the, I've said, you know, to you before, we're not here to change anything. We're here to see through it. Why? Because you don't have to change third density. You just need to transcend it, right? And if you think you're going to transcend it by changing it, you're trapped, because it, it doesn't work that way. Third density is third density. It's polarized, right? It doesn't stop being third density because you move out of it. You just aren't experiencing it anymore. But it doesn't mean, you know, for all intents and purposes, it doesn't exist anymore when you're not there to witness it, right? If there's no witness, where does it exist? So we have to, these things all kind of work together, right? 
so once the need isn't there for it anymore, it can fall away. It doesn't have to be there, right? Now, if she, um, Sunshine, was in the space of holding on to, I can't be a bitch, I can't be a bitch, I can't be a bitch, or moving to the other side of it and, re- and repolarizing and saying, oh my gosh, I'm such a bitch, right? And, and embracing that to the extent where now the other side of her gets repressed. Either way, she's just going to hold her reality here in place, okay, as far as it being polarized. So all that has to happen is she just has to see through the whole thing. She, she actually has to go in and own both sides. She can see where she is all love and light, but she can see where she, she's a bitch too. She's both, right? She can own that. And owning it means you really own the, I always say it's like, the, like you own like the feeling part of it because that's, that's the important part. That's the part that's the hardest for people to do the work because they, they're afraid to go into the, to the parts of themselves that hurt. But that's the necessary thing, right? They only hurt because you've stuffed them away. And once you get into it and you allow yourself to be in the pain, you find that it just kind of dissolves out, right? If you're afraid of going there, it'll never go away. It's always going to sit there and it's dictating what your reality is going to be. But once you can go in and own it and see where, you know, that bitch that I am was hurtful to other people. And you can own that and actually experience the pain that comes with seeing how we've hurt people we love, right? Because it is painful when you see that. Now, when I can own that, now at this point, I'm ready to move to the, the middle path of it all and transmute all of it because you're not either side, you know? You're, you're not the, the all love and light one and you're not the bitch either. Both of those are just polarized and they're just patterned consciousness it's not who you are it never was i don't care how many years you've been carrying it it still isn't you and it never was you it's just a program a program that got picked up and was you know identified with for however many years but it's just a program so you are ultimately that you know undying love and light the beginningless and endless love and light and that is the truth of who you are. Now, at that point, when you've seen through that, you can be that, right? And now you can be that in the world. You're not going to have to act that. You're going to be that. You see the difference? Right? You see the difference? Yes. Okay. So the thing that we um, see, I've got a few scattered notes here. I'm having to bounce around, make sure I'm hitting all the little things I wanted to hit. Um, don't misunderstand if you have a sense of what it is to be uh, enlightened, right? Enlightenment isn't like an, an, uh, a destination. It's not an ending point. It's a constant evolution. Um, it doesn't mean that a lot of people think that once you've attained, uh, you know, words are so horrible. Once you've attained a state of enlightenment that you're like detached from the world and nothing could be further from the truth, a master, from their sense of compassion, will take action in the world, right? Because compassion is the, um, it's the highest human emotion, okay, compassion. And a master will move into a situation and from that space of compassion for the people who are still uh, under the influence of, of Maya, who are in the illusion, they will take action, Right? You understand? So just like, um, you know, why would Jesus feel a need to heal anybody? That's a a good example. So if Jesus is in the space of of pure equanimity, right, knows himself to be God, knows everyone else to be God, knows that everything is perfect, why on earth would would he have healed anybody? Right? Let me think about that for a second. Why did he heal anybody? Because he had compassion for where they were sitting, right? He sees them as perfect, as whole, right, divine. And it was just that touch of his in combination with how he saw them that actually transformed their condition and their belief in him too, certainly. But it wouldn't, would, wouldn't be necessary for him, would it? If, if he is just in the space of knowing everything to be perfect, 
right? We can easily move through that world in that space. And it's necessary. And I was, we were talking about this before the program. This is a really, you know, if you find that you, that you feel like you're getting twisted around like a pretzel right now, <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me because these are really um, advanced um, understandings and they're kind of hard to put into words in a way that you get them until you experience them. It's just, it's, it's kind of difficult. So bear with me. I'm, I really am. I'm trying to make it all make sense. From it, when you, when you are going to do spiritual work, it is necessary that you move into a space of equanimity, right? That is the, the, the space at the Buddha, you know, the, the middle path, knowing that all things are perfect as they are, even though they appear to be very, you know, things can appear to be very bad. Other things can appear to be very good. You know, it is that space of equanimity that allows you to see that all things are divine and are perfect just the way they are. Okay. And don't need to be changed. So when that state of consciousness is attained and mastered, it's funny because something, something else kicks in. And all of a sudden, we find ourselves in a space where we feel like we have to take action. <laughs> right? It seems so paradoxical. Right. And so contradictory. Like, well, what do you mean? Like, you just, it's like one day you're the Buddha. <laughs> right. And everything is just perfect. And then the next day you find yourself like, oh my God, like I have to do something about that, you know? And so what mind wants to do with that is say, oh, look, you've gone backwards. You've gone backwards. And that's really not what's going on. Um, the difference is, see if I can word this correctly, that prior to attaining that state of experiential understanding, and, and I use the word experiential very purposefully because it is experiential. Without it, it's just mental and, it's, and it does not lock in. It's not yours at that point, okay? But when you attain that state, you've had the experiences that have brought you to the place where you literally could be anywhere experiencing the most atrocious, you know, acts of cruelty and you would be perfectly at peace, okay? That is true equanimity. It takes moving into that for you then to function from a place of right action, which comes from a non-polarized space versus taking action out of a polarized space, okay? If we're doing something because we, we have to do it because it's wrong and it has to be fixed, and the people who are doing it are evil and bad, you know, and we have to show them that, you know, just, and you, you hear what's going on there, is he, you know, how polarized that is. If we're functioning from that place, the only thing we're going to do is create more of it, okay, because we can't see ourselves in it. Oh, that was a good statement. So <laughs> can I repeat it? I don't know. What did I say? It struck me as being very, very good. <laughs> At a moment, it was like, oh, that was lovely, but I've lost it already. We can't see ourselves in it, right? But, and that is, that is the key, all right? You will only create more of it because you can't see yourself in it. Someone write that down <laughs> quickly. Okay. My students all know, write it down fast because I will not retain it. Okay, now, when you've moved into the space of true equanimity, at that point, from a place of compassion, remember, you know, with the Buddha, the tear in the eye of the Buddha is there to show that the Buddha was compassionate, 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 compassionate. Not compassionate for the, for the suffering, okay, but compassionate for the fact that those who appeared to be suffering, actually believed that they were suffering. And that's where compassion comes from. It's kind of like you, you are in the space now where you see that literally like you're awake and everybody else has amnesia, right? And so because you've walked out of that space and you've moved out of that space yourself, but you were in that space before, now you have compassion for those who are still in that space, you know? 
And it's sad. It's like, oh my gosh, like they can't even see themselves. I mean, and that's literally what we're talking about. You can't see who you even are, you know, but I see you clearly. So now we can look at the world and we can look at atrocious things that are happening in the world. And now we can take action from that place, right? Obviously, you know, like, uh, is it in the humanity's best interest to poison our food supply? No, right? <laughs> Obviously not. So, so we can go attend a rally, you know, that's against, you know, genetically modified foods, right? Because... We can hold, we can be at that rally, but then anyone who's there in opposition to us, we can still love that person, right? Because we see the divine in them. And so taking action from there can help to raise awareness. It can help to, to um, continually, you know, what we're here to do, raise the consciousness of the planet. But if nobody comes forward and does anything, remember God needs a body, right? So we can be inspired with divine you know, the will of God wants to move in this certain way and we can take that action. But if there's no body to show up to do it, then what's going to get done here? Yeah. So does that, do you feel like that makes some sense? <laughs> did, did I get to my point? Um, yeah, um, I guess the other thing is, because uh, I know we wrote down here that we can't be in denial about what's going on. and. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, you know, it's like um, there are too many people running around the planet now with, with self-imposed blinders on. And that's really what's going on. So there are those who are just in fear, you know. But there's people who are using um, their their spiritual understandings as their justifier for non-action. And we would call that spiritual ego. That is spiritual ego. So they will learn about holding the space of equanimity. And then they will use that as their justification for for taking non-action. I'm supposed to be, you know, here right in the middle and not do anything. And then they use that to make themselves feel better about the fact that there's all this horrendous stuff going on and they aren't doing a thing to change it. Right. And that's just denial. That's just another form of denial, but it hides very, it hides very effectively. Um, spiritual ego is a big one. Because people will do that all day long. The mind likes to hide in spiritual understandings and then use those understandings against other people. And then they feel justified in them because their understandings are true, right? That makes you wrong. And so now I'm going to sit here and I'm going to be judgmental, but I'm going to say it's okay because I have the understanding. <laughs> right? So the spiritual understanding can function um from both ends as far as being in denial about what's going on, but also being polarized about what's going on? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, someone who truly has an understanding doesn't need to throw it in anybody's face, right? Because you will, you will be with someone where they're at, unless there's a, there may be a, an opportunity to bring um, clarity to someone or to give them an opportunity to see something about themselves that would help them in their own journey, right, um, and help kind of expand their consciousness. If you have that opportunity, then you'll take the opportunity. But if you have, if you're up with someone who there's just not a, that's just not where they are, you know, to throw it in their face, well, what's, what's the point, right? Obviously, the point is because in that moment, it's my spiritual ego that wants to, wants to prove that it's right. And that's not serving any purpose other than keeping you trapped here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I think we need to we about wrap up time. Yep. Yeah. Wrap up time. Okay. Want to excellent. Plug the websites. So, yeah. Let's do a couple plugs. Um, the archives for the programs are uh, available for purchase on our site. Uh, again, we are a nonprofit organization, and um, we only exist because of donations from wonderful students and seekers like yourselves. So if you would like to uh, go over to the website, we are at theshambalacenter dot org. Um, you can go to the little shopping cart, and I guess that's where the archives are available. We also are on Facebook, and we're very active there. We love to post different things from different masters and, you know, everyday people, like whatever. Sometimes I, I stick my own little quotes on there, too, and that's uh, Facebook.com, the Shambhala Center. Uh, coming up this Tuesday night, um, next week, is our Lightworkers United uh, gathering. So we do that here in Charlotte, and we're bringing it 
it's going to go global. So if you want to join us from 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern time, we will be in meditation, holding space uh, for humanity and for the planet. We would love to have you join us um, from wherever you are. And if anyone is interested in getting the music for that, uh, you can always shoot us an email. Um, again, I love to take questions from people, so you can always send a question to questions for Shusada at the Shambhala Center dot org. Um, that would be great. And leave us feedback on the BBS site. We'd love to see that too. Um, let us know how, how everything sounds on your end. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. We will see you again next weekend. Um, all our love. Love you. Good night.